Welcome to the Browser Talk for Automation Nerds. We will take you on a journey into our engine world and introduce you to the secrets behind Robot Framework Browser. Fast in your seat belt and follow us down into the rabbit hole. Hello, I am Kerkko from the browser team and I am here to talk about uh, the internals and architecture of Araf browser, why we did it the way we did and what are the advantages and disadvantages. So uh, first about history, why we don't just use Playwright Python? Uh, so do you remember when this pro project started in the summer of 2020? Playwright Python wasn't there yet, uh, so uh, the, basically uh, Mikko and Tatu were ideating that yeah, we want to use this, make this Playwright library, and uh, but it's a Node library, and we need to use it in Python to make it a robot library. So then, uh, then they decided to try gRPC. Then when I and Janne were brought on board, we continued with that direction, basically building a gRPC wrapper on top of the Playwright features we wanted to use, and uh, ended up with an architecture where there's gRPC uh, working as the bridge between TypeScript and MUPU. And uh, that enables us to type check both uh, sides of the implementation quite well. And why we haven't yet moved on to Playwright Python? Uh, well, the implementation is trickster in that uh, we actually know what uh, we are putting through the lines. So we can actually see which features of Playwright we are uh, using. There's like no we don't end up accidentally using this or that playwright feature without making it clear in the architecture. So, uh, and another big reason is that uh, it would need significant refactoring. So it would be probably like with the volunteer work that is currently being applied to the development, it would be a multi-month effort with no new features and probably new bugs, because a new architecture usually brings about new bugs and like the current code base works for what it does. Uh, then why, why one would want to actually use browser versus Playwright Python? So if you have looked at their APIs, uh, there is significant difference in how we abstract the internals. That is because we provide the robot framework keyword API and that makes our API procedural instead of one where you receive objects like pages and call methods on those and call methods on the return met uh, objects. And that means that like a uh, browser gives you uh, higher discoverability of the features provided by the library at the cost of it being a m bit more abstract and for example garbage collecting the pages by default because we have the auto closing and that's like that's also something playwright doesn't give you playwright does it uh, fully automatically you just like use the objects and then when they are out of scope it cleans them up um, which doesn't fit with robot framework, but it can actually work in your Python code. So if you're looking to use uh, write browser or play write Python test code, I would actually try out a bit of both, like a few hours of proof of concepting on both and see the difference. It's not that big. There's a bit of a readability difference, but... And then... Uh... What actual behavioral differences came about when we implemented uh, like the browser abstractions and especially when we want them to be able to use in robot, we ended up with two big problem domains. The first being event handlers, which are kind of a new thing in robot or sort of, and then also promises. And we just went through and implemented both of those like raw and that has given us differing user experiences like the event handling and promises are a bit complicated but they also enable some use cases that you like can't as easily achieve in something like selenium library and i think that's all for my part uh, thanks and see you in the good day hello i'm going to talk about uh briefly about extending browser library with javascript modules and this is kind of cool nerdy feature that we have. So you can basically make a normal common JS JavaScript module containing functions, which are presented as keywords in the browser library extended version that you can use. 
Uh, there are four arguments that your own keywords done in JavaScript can take in. The first one is the page object. This is just the normal page object from Playwright library. Then we have arguments, which are a list of arguments coming from the robot framework uh, test or task side. So this is a list of strings coming from there. Then we have the third option, which is a logger that you can use to log things uh, to the output XML and to the log HTML. And the fourth argument is the Playwright object, which is the whole module of Playwright. That means this one. And it contains all the fancy stuff that you can access also. The page object is the current page that uh, also the browser library is accessing it. And the Playwright module is the Playwright module that the browser library is using. As an example of this, I've created this small extension. So extension is added to the browser library on the library import with this JS extension equals then the path to the, uh, your module. I also use enable presenter mode in this to make it more visible for you to see what is happening. Uh, then when we go into the module itself, this is what it looks like. So common JS modules need to have these in there. So here are the keywords that are registered. So register my selector is a keyword here in that is done in JavaScript. And then there's server errors and other keywords that I've built there. And these are used in in here. So register my selector is an example of using playwright possibility to register your own selector strategies there. So it registers the name of my selector. And in this case, I'm using it so that it will actually call the underlying CSS selector with data titles there. And I'm just going to show briefly on where I'm going to use it. So in the test page, in this case, the page of the company I work for, we have these clickable elements here. And if I go and see them in the developer tools, you will actually see that they are these, these links here. And they have this data title here, and I'm accessing that to access the name of there because it's using fancy stuff to create create this kind of uh, CSS translation when you move, hover on these. So I'm basically targeting the data titles here. So I'm registering a selector there for that. And that you can you do directly in the JavaScript side. And then I also have another example keyword which is server errors, which will modify the page so that every uh, request to the uh, servers will actually uh, be mocked to be internal server errors. So once this is on, no, no real uh, request to the servers will go on. And here is my test case. So I'm first opening the browser to the pagereactor.com. Then I register my selector. So after this, I can use it. And this is how I use it. So I just say my selector equals and then whatever is in the data title. And first one should go through, then I take a screenshot, then I make the servers all say 500, an error. And when I click another button there, then we should end up in a page that is from the situation where the servers are saying error. So let's see how this goes. So 
So it first targets the work and then about. But here we can go to the internal server error because that is used there. And then it passes because I don't have any any real uh, validations there. And if we go to the log file, we should see also the similar situation here. So register my selector works and you also see the lockings from, from the JavaScript side there. Server errors also works and the screenshot works. So it actually went to the work page and so on. And that's it about JS extensions. Let's talk next about data types and some tricks with the assertions. As you may know, Robot Framework 4 does support new libdoc structure and it does also support data types. Robot Framework 3.2 already also, but Robot Framework 4 has more advantages from the data types. This is built in library. As you see here now, the arguments are ordered vertically. You see first and second argument of the keyword should be equal as integer. So it accepts something, but converts it to integer internally. We could now change that. This here is without type hints. And this here is the code of this keyword. What we see here, we see here a convert to integer um, keyword. What we could do also with this keyword, we could use a type hint here and a type hint there. And we create libdoc again and refresh it. And we would see here two type hints, int, int. The good thing here is Robot Framework does automatically convert whatever I use here to an integer. If this is not possible, it would give an error message. So for example, if I say should be equal as int one, so the word one, and then the character two, it would complain that the word one is not convertible to integer or the string. But one and two as characters are convertible, so it would be converted as integer and then will be compared. In browser library, we use this completely. So every argument is typed, has a type hint. And Robot Framework does the conversion for us. So here, for example, we have our click keyword. We do see that the selector is again a string, but the button, for example, is a mouse button type. And here I can click on that mouse button type, and I see that the allowed values are left, middle, and right. Case insensitive in this case, if I'm using it from Robot Framework. And this data type is used by click and by mouse button. What do we have else? We have int, we have time delta. So like in robot framework to sec to ms 200 s or something like this as a time command. We have two floats, we have two booleans that are automatically converted and we have modifiers, which are keyboard modifiers. These keyboard modifiers could be alt, control, meta or shift. Let's see how this looks like in our source code. This is our click keyword. And as you see here, we use Python 3.7 or newer um, to have these type hints. So selector is a string and mouse button is from type mouse button, which is an own enumeration. And it has mouse button dot left as a default value, which means here it's just writing left. So the name of the enum member is automatically shown here, documented in libdoc, and it's also automatically converted. So you don't have to write mouse button dot left here. Let's have a brief look to that enum. And we go there and we see here our mouse button enum. We have left, middle and right with, we don't care what is the value within there. So we just see auto here. Let's get back to the assertions and see where we use these kind of assertion operators and these data types. So get attribute as an example has a selector for the element we want to manipulate or we want to get something, the attribute, which attribute value we want to get, and we have the assertion operator. And now we want to look to the evaluate and the then closure. So let's have a look here. We have that attribute here which is basically that begin 10 o'clock and it has a data time attribute, which has a ISO date time string here. And this time string we want to have and we want to manipulate. 
I'm using here the uh, debug library to directly interfere with robot frameworks. So I can get that attribute and we see we get a pretty long string, the full ISO time format. But what if we just want to get that 10 column 00, zero from that? We could say get attribute and then evaluate. And then the next one would be a Python expression that works with this value. So the value I'm getting from get attributes, so this long string, is also here in that namespace, the value. So what we could do is, for example, value.split, and we split that value at the letter T. And from that, we just want to have the second entry, which mean that one. And as you see, now that one returns just 10 dot uh, column zero zero column zero zero plus and we want to split it maybe again dot split by the plus character and here we want to have the first element and as you see here now we get the time string and uh, then we could work with that for example the next cool thing is the validate assertion operator this has to validate to a Boolean value, which means, for example, if we say uh, 10 column 00, zero column 00, zero in value, would also mean like this 10, st uh, the string here in front has to be in the value, which would also be true. If I would say 10, zero, 01 is not in the value, so it would give me an error. So here we can use Python expressions, if there is any assertion operator that is not able to uh, fulfill our needs, we can easily write a small expression in Python, and it works completely the same as the evaluate expression. And now Tatu will tell you a little bit more how you could use this assertion operators and how you could use our assertion engine. Go on, Tatu. Thank you. And my name is Tatu Aldo. And I'm here to talk about the browser library assertion engine. And hopefully when these talks comes out in the Rubicon, we have actually made a release from a separate project called assertion engine that contains the code for the browser library assertion engine, which enables you to use the assertion engine in your own libraries or in your pro own projects. But meanwhile, you can find it from the GitHub market square project assertion engine. But how do you actually use it in your library? Let's take a look. Here's a typical keyword that verifies that the received value from the system is one. And it does assertion, it provides error message, and then it returns the possible value if the assertion passes. And I have hard coded the value as one because just to simplify the code. But how you would turn this type of keyword as an assertion engine using keyword? Well, you would first need to define a few other parameters or arguments for the key to assert the on operator, which is optional. And that comes from the Python typing library. And it's assert operator is the type and it comes from the accession engine library or package and it default value is none because it's an optional thing and then you need assert expected expected and it's also optional because we're dealing with int, let's take a look at int, and it's also an optional value. And perhaps you want to define a custom error message, which is also an optional value. It's usually a string, and it's none also. So that's about the arguments. Then you return, and you do verify assertion. And that's also come from the assertion engine. And then you feed, first you feed the value that you get from your system. Then you define the operator that you want to use this assertion. And you define the expected, message, expected value. 
Then you can customize the default error message inside of the error message assertion engine by defining a prefix. And then you can overwrite the whole error message with the custom error message. And that's it. Nothing else, nothing less. And here I have a test. It uses my library. It uses this equal keyword and it verifies that the value that we get from the system is one, equals one. And let's run my test, it passes. And here's the log file. Let's see how it looks. Arguments, it returns the value is equal one. But does it really work? And how does the prefix look with the error message? Let's change the value to two here. Let's run my test again. It fails as it should. How does it look now? So here's the prefix message that I defined inside the library keyword and one integer is clearly not two. And that's it. And everything else is taking care of the assertion engine. So it's a really easy thing. It's just define the operator and the expected value. You get your value from your application and pass it along to the assertion operator. And then do the next person. Promises are a cool feature in Robot Framework browser library. They allow you to wrap browser library keywords to be executed on background. For example, here we have a do x keyword, which is imaginary, that is promisified by calling promise to keyword uh, with it, and then waiting for that with the wait for keyword. So the do x will be executed on background. As an example of where to use this, Here's a very basic web app that will show text beginning, dog and cat and the end. The funny thing about this app is that dog and cat are in random order. So a naive way to try to test this would be like this. So first you would check that there is text called beginning. Then we would click the button and then check that there's a cat, then dog and then the end. But unfortunately this will from time to time fail because cat and dog will change their order. To make this work we can promisify cat and dog constraints. And this is what it looks like. So we will start looking for element containing cat before clicking. Also we will start finding for element containing dog text at the beginning before the clicking, uh, but we will promisify those both. And then we will click and then we will wait for those promises to be fulfilled at some point, and then we will also expect there to be an element with the text the end at the at the end of the test case. Let's see how this executes. And that test case passes. Let's see the log file. So here we have the promises. They will actually not return anything worth of mentioning, but wait for keywords will then wait for those promises. And that's it about promises. Enjoy them. Hey guys, welcome back to Robocon. Hey. 
Hey. Okay. Hello. Hey, hey. All right, let's jump right into it. We have uh, just a few minutes for questions. First one is, uh, it's for Tattoo. What part keyword of browser library can handle the ID's auto-generation issue for Salesforce application automation tests? Well, the browser library doesn't help you on that, but in your source code, you can generate other kind of IDs, these kind of testability IDs that always will be the same for that element. So you need to ask your developers to add those things into your code. Absolutely. Uh, next question is about promises. What is the default timeout for promises to keyword? Can we modify timeout? I can take this. Uh, so I think it's 10 seconds. It's the default timeout that we have for everything. So you can modify it. Also. Great. Uh, next question is from Michael again. Does the uh, promises need to be fulfilled in order to, as defined in test? No, that's the point. They don't need to, uh, you've wait them and they will happen at some point before that waiting ends. But two, they want to know why is equal keyword arguments assertion operator and expected were optional? Ah, because we designed it so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so maybe maybe to addition that the, the idea was what Tatu said that we don't want to have for every assertion a single argument uh, a single keyword. So we said we want to have less keywords that are have multiple purposes. So we want to get rid of these assertion keywords. Mm -hmm. And therefore we said, okay, getters are normal getters, but you can have optional assertions. So let's go to Slido for the next question. It is about your custom selector. So if my web application has input fields with the text label next to them, could I write a custom selector to find those input fields by the text label instead of using Cascade and XPAT CSS selectors? Yes, you could, but you shouldn't be <laughs> doing that because the text labels actually will be targeted with the current setup. So that will also work with normal text label. It's for you, Renee. Do you know if Robot Framework uh, LSP already supports custom types like mouse button for auto completion? Uh, not yet, but we talked already I'm yesterday pretty sure it, it does or no, it does it not. Okay. okay. Oh, okay. You, you are you are from Robocorp. But yes. Well, no. We if you talked about, about it yesterday, I wouldn't know it. So <laughs> <Sorry>. yes. Uh... <laughs> yes, but it's 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 on 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 the radar. Okay. Browser library. Any plans to support using browser drivers other than Playwright, like say Selenium? Would that defeat the purpose? No. No. That would be no, a no. really big hassle to maintain for the like small benefits. Benefits? <laughs> Michael, Michael, <laughs> uh, another question is, uh, is it possible to use promises to check for optional optional appearing elements? Example, loading spinner, which appears when a backend call is too slow. Yes, you could have your, well, yeah, with some modifications, yes. <laughs> what happens when the driver crashes? There is no driver. Best crashes. Is what happens yeah. when well, Playwright crash. can crash. So yeah, the, the, like, the library can crash and then you get a not so nice stack trace. Uh, yes. You do get a stack trace. Cool. Um, Robin wants to know, <laughs> promise is a TypeScript term while the implementation usage looks like a Python future implementation. What was the keyword name choice based on? Because you asked, please promise to wait. <laughs> yeah. It was more, more on the, not on the technical point of view, more on the usage. It, it would be funny if it would future to or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> future to that element. <laughs> so next, uh, I guess it's, this is more like feedback or every time I see a demo of these new assertions and especially the selectors, I am amazed, but it looks powerful and easy. But every try, I try it myself, I am lost. Is there some training material available? Uh, yes, sorry, there is not. 
there's very limited training material available, but we would be happy to get more and we are happy to get pull riggers to enhance our documentation. So if you figure out, please write us a pull request so others doesn't have to survive the, or suffer the pain that you're having. Time for one last question. Uh, people always ask about iframes. Browser library handles the iframes or multiple windows. Does it handle file upload, download, pop-up windows? This was a common pain for the Selenium library as well. So are we going to overcome the pain point with the browser library? Yeah, so iframes oh. are a little bit different in um, browser libraries. So you have not to select an iframe and then your scope is on that iframe, but you have just the iframe prefix as part of the selector. So you would have the iframe selector and then three of these um, arrows and then your, your sub selectors. And um, yeah, Karko, about the dialogues. Yeah, so I think that the dialogues work like... Uh about fine like uh, they are still not like excellent but then the file upload is actually a bit bad and we have been looking for feedback and uh, ideas to fix it for quite a while and maybe hopefully but, it will be fixed very soon there's, if there's real need there's actually a different approach in browser library so browser library really mm -hmm. handles the dialogues so you have to make it as kind of a promise so first you say make an upload and then you click the button and then the dialog should appear and it's uploaded. So you don't have to put the text of the file into the input field as you did it in, in Selenium library. So it's it's different. We have some some issues there, but it's it's I think better handling as mm. a Selenium library on the technology part. And Windows and uh, pages are definitely better than Selenium. All right, uh, probably time for definitely time for one last question. We're four minutes over. Uh, Dave Martin though, I've worked <laughs> with them, so I'm kind of being kind of, uh, you know, Anyway, your website looks structured just like the main robot framework website. Is this a new standard that libraries should follow? <laughs> well, it's not the standard. We just forked it because we like the style. Or, the, the, well, the good some of us like the style. With, with open source stuff, you can just take it and, and use it. Yeah. <laughs> Copy paste. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> yes, with proud. All right, guys, thanks again for this awesome. It's your sessions are really well done, so I really appreciate it. Thank you for everything you've done for RoboCon this year and look forward to um, much more from you all. Thank you so much. See you on the dark thanks, side. Thanks, Joe. On the dark side, that's <laughs>